Well, we have a God that answers prayer. Aren't you glad that there's no God like Jehovah? We're going to be in Joel chapter 2, and we're going to briefly uh, just take a moment in verse 17 is where we're going to start. We kind of finished there last week, but if you weren't here last week, or if you were, if there's a refresher, you remember last week was a lot of uh, disaster. Uh, I think it's foreboding of Babylon that was going to come over and enter down into Israel and wipe out Israel. There was an army coming from the north, and it was predicted it was going to be terrible. Joel 1 was about the locusts and how the locusts would go in and eat everything. And I was thinking about that this week, as a matter of fact. Two weeks ago, we talked about Joel chapter 1. But for them to eat all those crops, who put those crops there? And then I thought the people put all that work, tilled the soil, planted the st- uh, uh, vegetables and what, what they were planting, the crops they were planting. They started seeing them come up and grow up and rise up and grow. And it was going to be a, a great year, agricultural industry. You know, we're not set up like that, so it doesn't really maybe dial into us too much. We're going to probably talk about that a little bit here when we get to chapter uh, 2 in a moment. But they had done a lot of work. You ever feel like you've done an awful lot of work? You've done the groundwork. You've done the everything you're to do, and then all that you did amounts to nothing? That's worse than not even doing anything. It's worse If they eat your grass, is one thing. If they destroy your garden, it's another, you know, the locust. So we saw that in Joel chapter 1. Joel chapter 2, I think, is talking about a great army coming in in Babylon. It says a great army from the north was going to come. And then, of course, as I mentioned last week, Joel 3 starts doing, uh, those things have happened in the past already. Joel 3 is, I still think, a future event of talking about Armageddon coming, the great and terrible day of the Lord. But I want us to focus on, and all the stuff we see in our world today, in our country, in our nation, in Afghanistan, in Louisiana, COVID, the hospitals, all these wave after wave after wave of what we would consider a man-made or natural disaster or whatever you want to quantify it or qualify it as, it's trouble. We wake up with anxiety, we go to bed with anxiety. We, we start just finding ourselves becoming numb. You hear something and it's like, oh, well, that happens. And it's, it's almost numbed us from what's going on around us. And we pray, we pray to God and we ask God, but chapter uh, 2, verse 17, last week we closed with, and I want to pick up there together, it said, let the priest and the Lord's minister weep between the porch and the altar. And we talked about that last week, the porch and the altar in the tabernacles where the two uh, sacrifices were brought. And one was slaughtered and the blood was taken from that animal. The other one was, uh, the priest would put his hand on the goat and the sins, they would take that goat and put it out in the wilderness and that goat would turn wild and would stay away from people. And that's kind of imagery of that our sins would be taken away to never come back. Well, we know because of the cross, we know what that image really is talking about. It's talking about Jesus, and as I mentioned last week where John said, there is the Lamb of God, that's God's Lamb that's slaughtered, that takes away the sins of the world, that all of our sins was, were laid on Him, and they will never return to us. Jesus fulfilled both sides of those two different animals at this historical setting for hundreds or thousands of years, the nation of Israel did, Jesus fulfilled that. And what I want to say is when we go there, and we cry out to the Lord, and we plead with Him at the place of forgiveness at the place of mercy. For us today, that would not be the porch and the altar, that would be the cross. And that cross is anywhere in the world. Today is Evangelism Sunday. Today is the day of salvation. Today is if you're saved, if you're a believer. Today might be your day of salvation where you just say all these problems that are going on around me, I want to have a clear vision of Jesus Christ. I want a clear vision of where I'm in church here at Autumn Creek and what Autumn Creek is doing. And we want to see as we move forward and grow and mature as believers, we, we can have that comfort and we don't go through our lives full of anxiety. I, I say that anxiety is probably the most well-received sin in the church today. Are we commanded in the Bible, fear not, be anxious for nothing? We get so many Christians I see go through our lives worried and torn up inside and And yes, those valleys happen, but at some time we got to get out of the valley and get up to the mountaintop and see the sunshine. I was talking to my oldest daughter yesterday, and we were doing some work, and she said, uh, started rain. I said, boy, I hope the rain holds off. And she said, well, you know, without rain, you never have rainbows. And sometimes those sorrowful moments are sorrowful because we feel what sorrow is. We know what joy is in the Lord. We we see the sorrow of the world, and we see the anxiety and the fears of the world, but we have the joy of the Lord. That should be what drives us through our day. 
That should be what drives us in our interaction with other people. How's it going? Miserable. I'm this. I'm that. I'm scared. I'm worried. I'm this. I'm that. Aren't you a believer? Uh Uh-huh. What do you believe in? Well, I love this verse 17. I wish I would have spent more time on it last week. At the place of mercy, at the place of forgiveness, listen to the people's voice. Oh, Lord, spare your people. I, I read that last week. I went over it this week. I was doing some more reading on that. After all that's been told to them, a disaster that's coming, after all that's told to us in the newspapers, the news, what we see at work, here at work, what we see on Facebook and Twitterverse and all those other things, I don't know them all of them, but you know what I'm talking about. All the stuff we see that's always negative. Don't focus on that. Get on our knees. Lord, spare us, your people. Spare us. And as I was meditating that week, this week on this verse, spare your people. And I don't know if you come to, saw this where I'm headed. I didn't see it till this week. I didn't see it last week. Romans 8, 31 and 32. You may not know the address there, but I'm sure you know the, the verse when you hear it. Romans 8, 31 and 32. What then shall we say? If God is for us, and he is, who can be against us? And the next verse, he who did not spare his own son, we're crying out to God to spare us. And he answered that prayer. I will spare you. It was my son. I will not spare my own son for your sake. Do you know how awesome that is that God, when we cry out to him, save me, spare me? Okay, I'll answer that prayer in the affirmative. Son, you're not going to be spared. He who did not spare his own son, but he who delivered him over for us, how will he then not also with him freely give us all good things? When we ask God for comfort and to spare us and to save us and to help us through our day, those verses right there say, when you understand that God would not spare his own son to answer that prayer for you, is there anything you think he won't answer? God saved me. Okay, son, you die for Dale. God, help me get through the day. Oh, that's, that's small, easy for the God we're talking about. We sang a moment ago, there's no God like Jehovah. We sing it here. We know it here. We've got to let that get deep down into us in here. There's no God like my God. There's no God like that. There's nothing out there in the world I need to be worried about at all. Because there's no God like my God. He's God. So as we move down here, I want to just start there, like I said, in verse 17, to get us primed kind of for what's coming here in these next few verses, 18 and following. If we go to the Lord and cry out to him for forgiveness, spare us, save us, we repent of our sin. We repent of our negativity. We repent of our anxieties and our fears. We repent of that. We're going to put our trust in the Lord. Um, and, and then there's two things they actually ask. I'm sorry, on verse uh, chapter 17, uh, chapter 2, verse 17, they say to spare us. And then the second part of that verse, in my Bible, on the next page, it says, and do not make your inheritance. Do not make us a reproach among the nations. And that's what he's kind of alluded to. When we go out in the world and say, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, but I'm miserable, I'm sad, I'm scared, I'm worried about everything, I don't know about this, I don't know about that, hurricane, COVID, mask, no mask, vaccine, no vaccine, ivermectin, all these, uh, what do we tell in the world? I think to a little degree we may be saying, my, I don't know that my God can get me through this, and that's why I'm so worried about it. So what they ask here is spare us, save us, and let us not be a reproach. Don't let the nation say, ah, look at Israel's God. Look what the condition they're in. Locusts came in, ate everything, they're miserable, they're sad, they're broken down, they're complainers, they're negative. They're saying, God, don't do this to us because the nations around us will besmirch your name. Well, as we go through our lives, we've got to say, God, I don't want to do something or live in fear or tell people, yeah, I'm a Christian, but I'm scared to death of everything all the time. I don't want to go out and witness, I don't want to do this because I'm scared, I'm scared, I'm scared. What does that tell the world about our God? I'll, I'll tell, I know what it tells them. Hypocrite, I thought you trust that God. I trust him to get me home to heaven. Do I trust him in my day-to-day here? So there are two things. There's spare us and help us not be a reproach to your name. Does God want the name of his son, Jesus Christ, glorified? So when we pray that prayer, we're in alignment with God's will. You don't think God will withhold that from happening? 
if we go to him and cry out to him? And the answer is yes, he will do that. He will let us be a people that say, that's the people I want to be with. Those people seem to know what they've got. They've got something good going on about them. And then we can bring them in. They said, we don't want to be a byword among the nations. Why should they, among all the people, say, and then it says here, where's their God? They talk about this God that's all-powerful, all-controlling, but they live like they're scared to death of everything. Well, where's their God? We, have to, we can't live that life. Verse 18 says, then the Lord, if we come to this place where we say, God, I not only say it here, I not only sing it here, but I believe it with everything in my being. There is no God like Jehovah. I'm going to live my life according to that principle. There's no God that protects his people like you do. I'm going to move forward in my life. It says at that point, then the Lord will be zealous for his people. And that, ze that zealous or jealous, depending on your translation, it says either word. I know in, in normally we say that's a negative word. Is this jealousy good or bad? Most of us probably say probably bad. What it means here is to have a uh, demand and exclusive relationship. When we're submitting to the demon of fear, we're not submitting to the God called Jehovah. When we submit to the negative aspects of this world and the systems of this world, we're not yielding to Jehovah. And he says, when you come to that point where I, I am your only God and you put no God in front of me and you live your life according to me, I'm going to demand an exclusive relationship with you. And that's what he did with Israel. Israel was chasing foreign gods. They were, yeah, God, we worship you, but we also worship this God and this God and this God. And God said, I'm going to have an exclusive relationship with you. A wife has a right to be jealous of her husband, and a husband has a right to be jealous of his wife. That's a covenant relationship. And in those relationships, the other person has a right to say, I have an exclusive relationship with you that no one else has that relationship with you. And that's the relationship God, Jehovah, wants with us, that we worship him in our minds. Our, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. And we spend so much other time in these other areas it removes him from being God over us. Or we say, yeah, you're God, but also here's some other things that control me. God says, that's not what I want. I want exclusive relationship. Is God a covenant God? I, I, yeah, I'm glad that you said yes, because in a moment he tells us that. In a few verses down here. He said that he will take pity on his people. If we ask God, these people ask God, spare us, O oh God, Help us not be a reproach to the people around us. Help us to be a, a shining light. Help us to be salt and light in this community. Let us be people that come look at us. And like when Solomon was there, he said, all the kings and nations would come to Solomon. And, wow, what awesome glory of this nation Israel. Th their God is God. It went from that to your reproach among the nations. Oh, you don't want to be like a Jew. You don't want to be like those Israelite people. You want to be like them. Look what misery they suffer. And they're saying, don't let us be in that position, God. Not for our sake but for the sake of your name, for your great name. Then if we get to that spot in our spiritual growth, the Lord will answer his people and say to them, verse 19, behold, I'm going to send you new grain, new wine, and oil. What did he take away last week? Grain, wine, and oil. He said, those things that I took away from you to get you to come back to me, if you do come back to me and repent fully, where I have an exclusive relationship with you and I am God and you live your daily life by me or with me in it or with me in the forefront of your thoughts, if you come to that position, I will restore all those things I took away from you because I want to give you good gifts. Jesus said in the New Testament, we're sinful people. If a son asks his dad for a fish, does he give him a, a snake? Or does he ask for bread, does he give him a rock? He said, no, parents here on earth, sinful parents give our children good gifts. How much more our Father in heaven when we ask for good gifts? Does God know that we need food? Does he know that we need drink, water, or whatever it is? He knows we need those things. He wants to give them to us. He said, because you're over here sitting, I'm going to start taking stuff away from you until you have nothing left but me. I will get an exclusive relationship with my people. I will start taking things away from you until you say, I have nothing left but God. I hear, I've heard many people in my life say, it got to a point where all I could do was fall on my knees and cry out to God. That's the point God will bring you. He will bring his people to that point. If he, if he needs to. It's not his will. That he's not his desire that we go that far off. But he said, I will have a personal, exclusive relationship with my people. But once we get to that point of God, you are our God, the blessings start coming. The safety, the protection, the security. So he says here, I will, in verse 19, I just read it, the Lord will answer and say, behold, I am going to send you grain. 
this is first person. If you notice, these are the words of the Lord came to Joel and Joel said. If you notice, you may not have noticed, this is first person indicative. It means God says, I personally, I'm speaking now, and I will perform an action in these verses. So when you hear them, this isn't just, which would still be 100% lock solid positive. Joel said, God said. Now God is taking first person singular. I will do this action. First person indicative means an action that's going to be indicated in this sentence. God says, I will basically pour out blessings on you. I will give you, in verse 19, behold, I am going to send you grain, new wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied and full with them. I will never again make you approach among the nations. So he, they just asked, spare us. We're starving to death. I'm going to send you food. Don't make us a reproach above, among the nations. I will never again make you a reproach above the nations. He answers in verse 19 specifically what they asked for in verse 17. Do we have a God that answers prayer? We just saw it right here in two verses. Specifically what they asked for is specifically what he said, I will do. I will do that. God, we ask your blessings on Madam Creek. God, right now, I ask your blessings on every member, every visitor, everyone at home watching. Number one, they come to the salvation message of Jesus Christ, your son. Number two, you pour out blessings, you pour out comfort, you pour out health. Everything we cry out for. Lord, I'm asking, I'm, I'm pleading with you, God, please, at a place of mercy, we're asking for your blood to rain down on us and your blessings to pour down on this church for every person that's here today. I believe God's going to answer that prayer. We saw he just answered their prayer. Why would he not answer ours? Well, he answered in the Bible. He answered their prayer. Answered, I don't know if he'll answer my prayer. He'll, he will answer. He's a good God. There's no God like Jehovah. We just sang it. I'm going to probably mention that several times today. We just sang that song. We know it. I, it's it's got to get nailed deep down into our spirit. There is no God like my God. There's no God like Jehovah. And then he says, I will, but I will remove the northern army far from you. This is the verse that would indicate the Babylonian army. I mentioned this back in Joel 1. People say, well, Babylon's east of Israel. The Bible's got a mistake in it. It says the northern army. We got all these mountain range here. They're much like uh, the mountain, our Rocky Mountains. And when Babylon came over, guess what they had to do? They came straight down from the north. They would have been the northern army. So he said, I will remove the northern army from you. And remember, because Israel had no uh, food, the locusts ate everything, all four. We mentioned the four different kinds of locusts. Could be different species, could be different stages of their maturity. The jumping locusts, the eating locusts, the gnawing locusts, all these different things. Th this army was going to come in, was going to make Israel a parched and land with, with nothing in it. I mentioned a few weeks ago where Israel is on the map, you'll notice it connects Africa, Asia, and Europe. There's three continents connected in this little swath of land. And over the years, there's been thousands and thousands, if not millions of people killed in warfare in that little place of land. When we get to chapter 3, we're going to probably allude to the Valley of Megiddo is right there. I, th I may have mentioned this last week. Uh, like we would have like foothills and hills and mountains in English. They have different words for different levels of size of mountains. J uh, Jabal means like big mountain. And then like a foothill would be a tell and maybe like a little bit smaller mountain would be a Har, H-A-R, it means like a small little mountain. Well, guess what? If you're looking at that mountain outcrop over the valley of Megiddo, you're, there's a place you can stand on called Harmageddon. It's the outcrop that looks over that valley. And I think we all would be comfortable with knowledge of Revelation, what that means. There's going to be a future war come to that area. But he says, as I remove this northern army, and they made your, the locusts made your land desolate, this northern army, when Babylon comes down, they're going to take everything, the gold, everything out of the temple. They're going to destroy the land. So rightly so, God says, here's what I'm going to do to your enemy. They gave you a parched and dry and distraught land, verse 20, but I will remove the northern army from you, and I will drive it into a parched and desolate, desolate land. God said, well, your enemies have put you through. I'm going to put your enemy through. The, the, very respectfully, I use this word, but the hell that the devil has put you through in your life, guess where the devil's going one day? Permanently. God said, oh, you did this to my child? Guess what I'm going to do to you, devil? That day's coming. You've heard me say it before. When the devil brings up your past, bring up his future. Devil, I know what I was back here. I know what I was here before Jesus showed up, and I know what I was after Jesus showed up. Sinner back here, sinner saved by grace here. Very humbly. I'm still a sinner. We're all still sinners. We all still sin. But we're sinners saved by grace. His son, he did not spare. He covered me in his blood. Satan, you had a problem with what's going on? Go talk to Jesus. 
When I kneel down and repent of sin, Lord, lead me in your path, conform me to the image of your son, all that protection comes over you. The devil can't lay a hand on you unless God let, allows him. Even then, God says everything that happens to you has been sifted through his fingers. I love that story of Job where the devil goes to God and says, can I do this? Why do you think the devil's asking God, can I? Because he has to. He doesn't have any power over you if you don't give it to him. And God has to allow it to happen. The devil can't do stuff to you. And I, and I always say the reason you read all that book of Job, Job 1.1, I've said this many times before, there's Job 1.1, one, one. we say, how did Job get through that? Job 1.1 one, one gives the answer. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and he was righteous before God. When you can stand righteous before God, you can get through anything. Talk to a person this week that said, uh, very, very, you know, and I've heard it too, and I said, I heard it. They said, God won't put more on you than you can bear. Have you ever heard that? Yes, he will. He will put more on you than you can bear, but he won't put more on you than you can bear with him at your side. When you've got that load on you and that yoke on you and it's weighing you down, it's bringing you to your knees, and you look over and you see Jesus, and Jesus is saying, keep going, brother, I got you, man, keep going. I'm with you in the yoke. I'm alongside of you. I'm here with you. I'm Emmanuel. God is with us. You can do this with me. You remember that show years ago called The Bear? Where they had that little bitty baby cub bear, that mountain lion was going to kill it. I see a couple of your heads doing this. And that little bear got up and, and behind him was like a 12-foot Kodiak that raised up like this. <laughs> and then that mountain lion ran away. <laughs> that little, little bear was, ooh, look at me. <laughs> I scared that mountain lion away. <laughs> well, guess who's behind you? Guess who's with you? Guess who's in front of you and behind you? Jehovah, Jesus. We have nothing to fear. He says, I'll remove them, and I'm going to send them away. I'm going to send them to the East Sea, to the West Sea, and their smell will go up. There'll be a stench in the land. They'll be the reproach, not you, not my people. Though the enemy will be a reproach in the land. Verse 21. Do you think God wants us to fear according to verse 21? Remember earlier we said back here in a few verses earlier, the passage said, earth quake and tremble. It, it, humans were first trembling and worried and scared. And you know, with the day, from because of the day of the Lord, because judgment was coming. And then it said the earth itself would tremble back, I think, in verse, uh, chapter 2 of verse 10. This same passage says, before the earth quakes, the heavens tremble, and, turn, and the moon grows dark. That's verse 10 of this chapter. Now down here it says, do not fear, O land. Rejoice and be glad. Why is the earth rejoicing and being glad? Because God's coming to that area and saying, I'm going to fix these problems. Can God fix problems? What was our biggest problem? Every human being has a major problem. Sin and death. No one escapes it. Nobody. I, I was down here praying. I wasn't sure I was going to share this, but I'm going to. I had somebody call me this week. I, uh, another prison I've never been in. There's a gentleman there. He's on death row. And the, the warden called me and said, I heard you'd be willing to come talk to this guy, would you? And I said, yes. I'll come talk to him. I probably, I, I'll get through it, but I'll probably start crying. But this guy, he, he's got a death penalty in the, in the nation he's from. He's got a death penalty here, and he said, if they send me back to the nation I go to, I probably won't leave the airport before I'm killed. They take you around the corner, pop, pop, pop. And he said, I'm going, I think, next Thursday back to the nation that I'm being sent back to. And I've been a devil worshiper. I killed my first two babies. I ate the, my third baby, my wife and I. My, my, or my, my second baby, we ate. My third baby, his mom is a witch. And I've been sitting here reading this Bible. And I need Jesus. He said, I'm dying in a week or two. I'm scared to death. I need Jesus. C can you lead me to Christ? And so I sat down in about two hours. We talked quite a bit about a lot of stuff. We finally got down and said, do you believe after what we've shared today that God loves you so much he did not spare his own son? And all your sin, all of it, was laid on the cross 2,000 years ago. Yes, I believe it. Do you believe Jesus died for you and his blood was shed for you individually? Yes. Do you believe he died? Yes. Then I said, do you believe he was buried? And he said, he was buried, but that's not where the story stops. He came back alive. Amen. I'm, amen. <laughs> this, this guy that's, you know... That's his past now. I said, bro, I said, early when I came in here, I called you 
offender, that's kind of what you say, uh, inmate, detainee. I, I, I told myself, I no longer call you that, I call you brother. He just started sobbing. He said, why doesn't people tell people about this? I didn't know. Church, that's us. This is Evangelism Sunday. Now, I don't know what his future is. I asked that warden if I could come back and talk to him. He said, yeah, but you don't have a lot of time. I, I'm not sure where this guy's going to be in two weeks. So I'm, I'm going to go back there. And then the warden had a, a trough for a cow out back in his truck. And he said, hey, I've got a trough out here. If you've got a little more time, can I go get that trough and bring it up here and fill it up with water? And can he be baptized before you leave? And he said, I want to be baptized. We baptized him right there and then. And the cow trough. Amen, God. There is no God like Jehovah. None. Verse 21. So God says, do not fear. Rejoice and be glad. I might have a little eye sweating going problem on right now. I don't know. <laughs> My eyes sweat sometimes. But when you get close to the cross, I think it's appropriate that it might be some tears, but it's, it's tears of rejoicing. You come to that place of between the porch and the altar where the animal was killed and the blood was shed. And when you get close to that, you understand not the physical what's going on there, but the spiritual what's going on there. And we just read, he did not spare his own son for me. He did that for me and the pain and the struggle that Jesus went through for me. And when you get close to that spot, I think it is uh, correct that we, our, our physical body starts saying you're, you're stepping into the spiritual realm, you're, you're getting around the edges of heaven, and, and our physical body starts doing stuff. It, our body says, praise God, we start clapping, we start crying, and are you sad? No, I'm happy. Then why are you crying? I don't know why I'm crying. I'm so happy. <laughs> you know, it, it just kind of takes over. We don't know why we do these things. In the, in the, it doesn't make sense that we cry when we're happy. But here it says rejoice and be glad. And that's what we can rejoice and be glad. We have a new brother and his name is written down in the book. And all his past is no more. I said it's wiped clean by the blood of Christ. Again, it was so, I was so uplifted, uplifted when I said, and then he was buried and he died. And he said, but it doesn't stop there. I don't, I don't believe that. Yes, he was, but he came back. I said, I'm, I'm getting there. <laughs> I had to tell him. I'm getting there. You didn't let me get, get there yet. He got right to it before I did. Brand new believer. The warden called out about six or seven guards to witness this. And I, I said, you know, you've told me your, your profession of faith in Jesus Christ. I'd like there to be witnesses here and see this. Do you believe? And that's kind of when he was in the water. I was saying, do you believe this? Do you believe that Jesus died? And, he's, and he came back alive. And the guard said, he's alive. He's alive. And I thought, he's witnessing. He's giving testimony to these guards now. There's no God like Jehovah. Death row guy may not be here in 10 days on this earth. Going to heaven, witnessing to people right there. He's alive. He's alive. Two of the guards said, praise God. They started crying. <laughs> you know, they're like, that's incredible. Do not fear beasts of the field, verse 22. Earlier last week, I said the, the natural... The, the, the uh, creation, that the world was out form and void, there was chaos. And then God stepped in and intervened and started bringing order. Let there be light. Let the earth bring forth vegetation. Let the, let the animals come forth. Let all the fruit bring trees. Let the sea come forth with life. Let the birds start flying. All these things, God brought order out of chaos. Then because of our sin, because Adam and Eve and us, the family of Adam and Eve, people say I'm a dysfunctional family. You've heard me say it here before. We all are. If you're from the family of Adam and Eve, you're in a dysfunctional family. All of us are dysfunctional. Every one of us. We don't work right. We don't think right. Even after we sa we're saved, we don't think right and act right. We, we get frustrated with one another and upset with one another because you're not doing what I told you to do and you're not behaving like, hey, go along as a brother and lift them up. You heard me say a few year, months ago, that story, maybe a year ago, those special needs Olympics where the one kid tripped and fell and the kids that were running looked back and saw their friend. They all walked back, picked him up, got in a line, and walked across the finish line together. That transcends sports. Because we see that's, that's, that borders the divine again. That's someone who's in need, and all these people just stopped what they were doing and went and grabbed that person and picked them up. And that's what we're about. 
picking people up that fall down or in the ditch and picking them up and crossing the finish line into heaven together. So we see here, it says, do not fear, O land, rejoice. Do not fear, beasts of the field. Because of our sin and the world was put into chaos, God's restoring order. The earth doesn't have to quake anymore. The, the animals of the field don't have to be worried and scared. Do not fear, beast. The pastures of the wilderness have turned green. Do you think those animals that looked at that dead pasture with nothing on it, the locust ate everything, it was all gone? Those animals just started walking aimlessly looking for food. Just in a, in a parched and dry land, barren land. He tells the animals, don't worry anymore. Food's here now. The fields are coming back. The pastures are coming back. The tree has borne its fruit. We saw last week the trees were going to be wiped out. All the fruit of the trees are going to be no more. In verse 22, God says the fruit of the trees are going to start bearing fruit again. The fig tree and the vine tree have yielded its full. So rejoice, O sons of Zion, and be glad in the Lord your God. Now he's talking to us. He talked to the earth, the animals, the fields, the fruit trees. He's talking to humans now. Sons of Zion, sons that have been delivered, my sons, be glad in the Lord your God. For he has given you the early rain for your vindication, and he has poured down for you the rain. Again, we don't get what's going on here necessarily. We're not agricultural society. The early rains in the spring, what do Mayflowers bring? I know allergies and hay fever, but <laughs> beyond that, what is it? April showers bring Mayflowers? When the earth has water on it in the springtime, it softens the dirt, softens the earth, seeds can get in. The, the ground is not like clay. Things can burst up through it. So those early rounds bring vindication. Hey, they got early rains. The early rains are going to, things are going to start changing when those rains come. In the spring, we know when those rains come, the fields are going to start turning green. Flowers are coming up. You start seeing little baby uh, squirrels and birds maybe fall out of the trees and you try to revive them back a little bit or little, all the life comes alive. Then the later rains are for pulling the crops out and getting that last bit of rain as latter rains. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. So those early rains vindicate. When God sent the early rains, the nation said, Israel's got rain again. To them, rain means fruit's coming, produce is coming, agriculture's coming. That's what the rains bring. So when God sends the rains, it's not there yet, but it's coming. So if you have years of locusts, you say, well, back here I was in this and this and this, and I wasted a lot of time, and I wish I, I've never met a Christian that said, I wish I would have waited 10 more years before I came to Christ. I've never heard that. I've heard often, I wish I would have got saved as a young person. I wish I would have came to Christ young. You young people back there, you have, you, you have I'm so jealous of you sometimes with your youth. Mo probably many of us are. You have your whole life ahead of you. So many here in this room, we're not going to, we could say, I was 30 before I came to the Lord. I was 35. I had, I still suffer from things I did back here that although I'm saved and things are going good, I still have things I'm dealing with back here. I wish I would have got saved earlier. I've never heard I wish I would have got saved later. I have heard it the other way. I wish I would have been brought up in a godly home. This guy, this, I told you about a moment ago, he said, why did no one tell me this? I didn't grow up knowing this. I wish I would have known this. He said, if I had known this years ago, my whole life would be different. Would have been, had he known years ago. But he didn't. Praise God, though. Doesn't matter. Anyone that calls the name of the Lord will be saved. Do we all agree with that? So, he's, so now he says, sons of Zion, be glad. He's giving you the early rain. They see the rain coming. You're going to be vindicated. People say, their God is blessing them again. Why? Because we see it on the horizon. We see the rain coming in. We know that God's doing a work in Israel or in his people. Verse 24, the threshing floors will be full of grain and the vats will overflow with the new wine and oil. These are specifically the things in chapter, earlier in chapter 2 he took away. I'll take away the wheat. I'll take away the barley. I'll take away the vines, the grapes, all the stuff I'm taking away. Now these places of what we would call production, he says they will be full. The fields will be full. Your, your production lines will be full. Your vats will be full. The granary will be full. The threshing floor will be full. Everything you have is going to be full. Lord, we want a bigger threshing floor and a bigger vat, I guess. If it's going to be full, give us a bigger one so we can take more. My cup runneth over, yes? God takes care of everything for us. So it's, uh, I did want to mention briefly here uh, in verse 26 and 27, well, we're not there yet. Let me get to verse 25. 25, I will make up for you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten. Can you, if you make $20 a day and lose it, can you make 40 tomorrow and make up that 20? You can make up money. Yes, yes, yes you can. can you, how do you make up time? If you wasted three hours yesterday, how do you make up three hours today? Lord, give me 27 hours. Yeah. So what it says here, there's really a miracle here when it says, I'm going to make up the years for you. This tragedy, as we mentioned last week, 
when he ate all the stuff, it ate also all the food for them, it ate all next year's crop, this was probably a two, three, four year problem Israel went through. This dry, barren, starving. It's, it went long enough. Remember it said last week or two weeks ago we talked about there was no more offering for the priest. The sheep and the goats and everything died. There was, there was no animals to bring in anymore because they had no food. This was a multiple year problem and God says, I will restore those years. Saying I'm going to bring you a bumper crop of produce, I've seen that in my life. You know, you've probably seen where you watch some of the news and said, boy, there was a bumper crop of tomatoes this year, or a bumper crop of beef, or a bumper crop of, you know, just for whatever reason, we had a lot of it this year. I've never, and next year you're going to have 385 days in the year, and they're all going to be 30 hours a day. I've never heard time being made up. So when it says here, I'm going to restore these things, that's still a miracle. God said, I'm going to do it. But then he says, I'm going to restore your time. And you might be saying today, what are you talking about? When you wish you would have got saved back here at 20 and you didn't, you waited until you were 30 or 40 or 50 or maybe you're still not, God says those years of production that you wasted back here by not coming to me, I will make them up here. New Testament, Jesus says some will bring 30, 60, and 100 fold, right? Three years of 100 is the same as 10 years of 30, right? God might say you might have brought 30 people, 30 people, 30 people, had righteous fruit that lasts, people just, but you lost those opportunities, I'll make them up. This is the time for you to be on fire for the Lord. In season, I think getting a moment ago, you said there was a time for this, there was a time for that. We didn't get to it. You were talking about Ecclesiastes back there with me. Uh, and we, and, but I said, but I, I love that verse. I think, in, I think it might be Philippians. You said you're going to do Philippians now, where it says, uh, um, I completely lost my thought. <laughs> if you're watching home, we'll edit this. This won't be on the, the live feed. <laughs> but... Uh, but he says, in season and out of, oh, no, Timothy, he's telling Timothy, in season and out of season, preach the gospel. How do you expect an orange tree to produce oranges in, Ju in, Ju in June? They're a, a more of a, a winter fruit going into the fall and early spring. But how do you expect, he says, you can't. But we're told God's going to restore those years, your production. The fruit and the vine and the wheat that was taken away, God says, I'm going to restore that. Your, your areas of production, I will restore. As Christians, what is our production? What's our fruit? Produce other Christians, make disciples, and do the, the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace. I'm going to restore those things and make a bumper crop for you. This is the, the mindset we have to have as believers in 2021 here in Houston, Texas. God, we are asking you to pour out abundant blessings on Autumn Creek. We're asking you to pour out abundant blessings on the members, the visitors, our community here of Autumn Creek. Let us be a bumper crop to our community that they say, wow, boy, I, I, want to, I don't know what's going on over there at that church, but I want to be part of it. I want to join in. I want to see what's happening. You know how blessed we are this last year with COVID, what's going on around the churches around us? I've talked to pastors. We're shutting down. We, we try to get the church up again. It shut down again. This one, that one, the other one. We're, we're going to the bank for money just to keep us afloat. Our ties are down. Folks, we're do, you may not know, but we're doing okay here. Look around today. We're averaging, I think, uh, Robert uh, Clough said, I think like 114 or some number, right at 100. Uh, we've done $50,000 of repairs in our building here in the last several months. We had 100 in the bank, and praise God, one of, I'm going to say our little young women in our church, I don't want to say little old women, I won't say that. One of our little young women in our church, uh, that Sunday after uh, Tithe Sunday, we preached on Tithe and came and said, you know, here's 50000 We're back to 100 again. We're doing pretty good, guys. God, I think God is pouring out bumper crops of blessing. We can kind of see them on the horizon coming. The rain's coming. The blessings are coming. Pe new people are coming in. We got a group of 30-year-olds and kids. And when I got here, we didn't have a whole lot of that group. We, we see blessings on the horizon coming. We've had every reason to be the most optimistic people in the world. We're Christians. And secondly, we're Texans. <laughs> We've got so much to be grateful for. <laughs> So God here in verse 25 says, I will make up for you all this stuff that you have regrets. God said, stop that. Stop regretting. Stop it. I'm God. I'll make it up for you. That, that stuff that you've put your time, your trouble, your energy, your kids, your grandkids, your, your marriage. I know it's a mess, but come to me. Fall down. Cry out to me. I will fix it if you will cry out to me. Verse 25, then I will make up for you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten, the creeping locusts, the stripping locusts, and the gnawing locusts. He could have just said the locusts, but what he said earlier about what's going to come take it all, 
by here mentioning every one of those locusts, it's a complete reversal of what happened. He could have just said the locusts and left it there. But by him taking this, uh, by the Lord saying, I will, this is first person again, I will uh, make up for you with this locust, this, all these problems, I will make them up and make good for them. And then also, just so we're not confused when troubles come, troubles come for two reasons to a Christian. To grow our faith, count it all joy when you're into various trials and tribulations and troubles because it grows your faith. The second one's discipline. God, I think right here is easy to miss. God's saying the trouble you're experiencing, my people, it's not haphazard. The creeping locust, the stripping locust, the gnawing locust, my great army which I sent among you. The, the negative was God too. Do we all see that? It's easy to read over that. God's saying, I want you to be clear. These hard times didn't come because they came. They came because I sent them. Do you think he's trying to get our attention? I think he's trying to get our attention. The troubles you're having, I let those troubles happen. I allowed them to get you to a place where you cry out to me. Because you did cry out to me. You came to that place of repentance and forgiveness. And even if you're a current Christian, that place today would not be getting resaved. It would be a recommitment or rededication or a refocus or God... I know I've got these sins in my life. I know I've got these negative feelings. I know I've got this anger. I know I've got this spirit. I've got a, a foul mouth, whatever it might be. Lord, I repent. Cleanse me of this sin that I'm dealing with. Clean it. Purge me from it. Get me back to be the child of God that you want me to be. Keep conforming me. When we get to that spot, God says, I'll take care of everything. I've quoted this verse several times, and we all know it. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all that stuff will be added. You don't have to fight for it. You don't have to work for it. You don't got to strive for it. We have to fight, work, and strive for God's kingdom and his righteousness. If we get that, God says, I'll take care of everything else. You don't have to do it. Now, not only does he say, I'm going to re restore this stuff. I love verse 26. You will have plenty to eat and be satisfied. Is he a God of just enough or is he a God of plenty? According to here, it says he's a God of plenty. He says, I'm going to give you just enough to get by. I'm going to keep you just barely broke enough where you're not starving to death. But that's not what he says. What he says here is, I will give you plenty to eat. My only regret is they didn't have any bacon. But he says, I will give you plenty to eat and be satisfied. Sorry. Okay. And, and, you will, and you will praise the name of the Lord your God. What is contingent on this? The two things at the beginning of this passage was, we come to that place of God, your God, and I'm not. I don't need to be in control. I don't need to make big plans. I don't need to micromanage everything in your kingdom. I just need to be still and know that you are God. I need to be listening to that still, quiet voice. I need to follow your lead and do what you would have me do, humbly. Seek justice, love mercy, walk humbly with God. What is required of man? Seek justice, love mercy, walk humble. If I want to get puffed up and prideful and be in charge of everything. God won't bless that. I was, I was reading a few weeks ago. I would encourage you, if you get a chance, read Genesis 11 and Genesis 12, those chapters. They're not just numerically side by side. They're, they have a, a joint meaning. The people say, let us do this. Let us build brick. Let us find a city. Let us find a valley. God tells Abraham in chapter 12 of Genesis, I will lead you to a land. I will build up your name. I will make you a great nation. Those two chapters are Genesis 11 and Genesis 12 show man's way and God's way. Man's way is we will control everything. God's way is no, you don't. You obey me and I'll control everything. I've told you that sticker my grandma used to have in her bumper seat of her, her bumper of her car. I know I've told you this. That says, God's my co-pilot. And as a kid, I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. That's God's my co-pilot. As a more mature, I said, that was the wrong, God's my pilot. If you think he's the co-pilot, you're in the wrong seat. You will have plenty to eat. You'll praise God, the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. Then my people will never be put to shame. You will know that I am in the midst of Israel. Emmanuel. God is with us. You will know. He says, here's three things. Um, verse 26b, there's a thing called an inclusio. We're not going to talk about this, but notice here at the end of 26, it says, you will never be ashamed. Okay? You see that bookend kind of? There's a bookend there. There's three things we're going to know. You will know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am Emmanuel. I will be with you. If you do these things, you will know that I'm in your midst. When you see blessings coming in, you will know that I'm in your midst. Second thing, I am the Lord, that's, now that's Jehovah. He's using the four-letter tetragram, which the Jews won't say it to this day, but I am the Lord, that's I am Yahweh, I am Jehovah, your God. You will know that I'm your God. 
You won't be chasing this sports team, or you won't be chasing that sin or this bottle, or you won't have control. You'll know that I am your God. You will know that. And the uh, third thing, and there is no other. By the way, when he says the word Jehovah, whenever you see the word Lord capitalized, I've told you that means Jehovah. That's how we translate in English as capital letters, L-O-R-D. That's the covenant name of God. So what God's saying here is you will know I'm in your midst. You will know I am in covenant with you. I am in the covenant God with my people, and there is no other. Remember we said this, God is jealous. He wants an exclusive relationship. He's telling us when, when you come through these processes, it, I always say it's never God's fault. It's always us. We want to get puffed up with stuff, and God said, I won't bless that. You've got to come to that place of forgiveness and knowing that I'm God, I'm in control, and if you do that, I will restore everything. I'll restore the years. I'll restore the, the food, the water, the, the wine. I would say that uh, I'll restore the barley. We might read that. I, I think New Testament, I think, is probably correct. When we see this in a moment, it says, I'll pour out my spirit. In Acts, Peter quotes Joel where he says, this is the day when you said they were drunk with wine. They're not drunk with wine. This is the day Joel spoke about over in Acts 2, chapter, uh, chapter 2. And Peter says, I will pour my spirit. And he quotes this passage here. So I think I'm correct in interpreting it. What's the best commentary in the Bible? The Bible. When Joel says this is what the prophet Joel was talking about, it is correct that that's what Joel's talking about. So when we study Joel, we are correct to say this is what the Holy Spirit meant because Peter in the New Testament told us this is what the Holy Spirit meant. So he's saying the food that's restored is God's word. God's word would start going out. The wine is the Holy Spirit. What they're telling in the physical, God has a spiritual plan going on. He says they're not drunk with wine in Acts. He says they're drunk in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's come upon them. The wine's not wine. It's the Holy Spirit that's poured out. So that inclusio was uh, in verse 26, they'll never be ashamed. They'll know that I'm in their midst. They'll know I'm a covenant God, and they know there's no other. My people will never be ashamed. So you see that ashamed and ashamed, those are the bookends. That's called an inclusio. You see it several times in Scripture where there's a statement here and a statement here that's identical, and the things in the middle is the focus. So the three things that we want to focus on, God is with us. He's a covenant God. Is God going to break his side of the covenant? He didn't spare his own son. That's, that's how serious he is about covenant. And uh, he, we will be his people. He wants an exclusive relationship with us. Verse 28, it will come about after these things. So at some future time, it will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your sons and daughters will see things for the future. I, I, often you've heard me 30, 40 years from today, most of us probably won't be here. I wouldn't think so. You know who will be? Hopefully some of those people back there. They still have a vision for 30, 40 years for this church. We, d we won't be here then. They'll, have, they'll be able to prophesy and see, the f see things. And, and also prophecy is not only prophetic, meaning future. It also means proclaim God's word. What did God say? That's prophesying. If you're saying God said, thus saith the Lord, blah, 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 you prophesy. You're saying what God said. We've taken that to mean future events because when God told his prophets, here's what will happen, and they proclaimed God's word, and it happened, people got this notion that prophecy meant you know the future. Well, if you start quoting Revelation, do you know the future? You're prophesying when you say Revelations, and you start talking about Revelation. You're saying, I know this will happen. Why? Because God said so. So what happens, it's not that you knew the future, it's that you knew the future because you read the book. Anyway, I don't want to spend too much time on that, just saying that about this verse here about prophecy. Your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions, even on the male and female. What he's saying here through this passage here is old people, young people, men and women, all social status, servants, slaves, men, women, boys, girls, olders, older people, elders, everyone. God said, I'm going to pour my spirit on everyone, not just old Jews or Israelites. Israel would have read this completely different than we're reading it. They said, oh, all of our nation, everyone in our nation is going to have the Holy Spirit. But that's not really what God's saying. He said, I'm going to pour it out on all people. Uh, if you look at verse 28, it will come about after this, I will pour out my spirit on all mankind, is what my translation says. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions. Even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. So here we have another inclusio, pour out spirit on who? On everybody. Pour out my spirit. There's two inclusios back to back in this passage. Verse 30, I will display wonders in the sky and on earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. I think this is still now a future event, Armageddon coming. And it will come about, 
I love verse 32. No matter what happens, aren't you glad of verse 32? I see a couple hands out there doing this. Whoever calls the name of the Lord. You mean a guy locked up in prison with a death sentence who killed his two children, even if he calls out? Even if he calls out. Whoever calls out the name of the Lord. Your translation might say will be delivered. It might say will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be those who escape, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There will be disaster and fear from what we just read there in verse 30 and 31 before the day of the Lord. Folks, I think that's going on in our world today. I think God is shaking the world up a little bit, trying to get people to focus on what's important. And with all the fear that's going on out there, we can join in that. And by fear, I just mean when, when you're afraid, oh, this miserable, is miserable, yeah, you're right. That's what I mean by joining in. That, that's all I mean by that is you need to say, you know what? I know that's going on. There is trouble, but I got good news. That's how, we've, that's how we change that conversation. We don't, yeah, it's miserable and this and that and a hurry. I don't know what's going to happen. I have no idea what's going to happen. And I'll tell you, folks, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if our church isn't part of, depending on what happens in Louisiana, maybe being part of helping there. You, you know, we might be able to do something. I don't know what's going to be bring stuff. I don't know if it's going to be, I don't know what the Lord's going to ask us. But don't be surprised if in a week or two we're not, hey, guys, can some of us have a collection or diapers or can we get some stuff over? I don't know. But don't be surprised about it. And so when if that comes, you're able to go, you want to get over there and sit and listen to people. I call it the, uh, the uh, gift of listening. They just want to tell you their story. When any people just sit there and I lost my home last year, I lost again. They just sit there and be with them. Hey, it's terrible. There's no way I can sugarcoat that. I'm sorry you lost everything, but there's, I've got some good news. God's in control. You, you can, you can you, no one's promised a good start, but you're, you're promised a good ending with Christ. Let me talk to you about the God that I serve, because there's no God like Jehovah, and, and God can get you through here. Well, there's no help. There's no, you know the perfect thing I've done in those situations? Why do you think I'm here? You say God doesn't sell, send help? I, people say God, doesn't, God won't send help. Ma'am, sir, what do you think I'm doing here? Oh, I hadn't thought about that. When you're standing to someone that says, God has some help, you say, I'm here in the name of the Lord. He sent me. They don't have a very good answer for that. Oh, well, what can you do? What do you need? I need water. I need food. I need diapers. We, we can get that for you. It's not from us. It's from the Lord. These are excellent times in the world we live in today with all the fear, with all the stuff that's going on. It's a, it is not, I cannot think of a better time for us to be as evangelical on, on Evangelical Sunday to get that spirit deep down in our bones and say, we're going to start lighting Houston on fire. In a good way, with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Not in some of the ways other people have done, <laughs> but in a good way. So I'm going to ask you to bow with me in prayer. And folks, if the Lord's working on you, if you need to come down here, stand where you are and pray, come down to the altar, just seek the Lord's will, what's going on in your world, your family. Pray for the Afghanis, pray for Louisiana, stand where you are, come down, whatever you want. Really, I'd also, if you say the Lord's working on me and I need to come to know Jesus Christ as my Savior, I've, I know about him, I go to church, I give tithes, I... You know, I would, I'm a Sunday school teacher, and I don't know that I've actually, actually made Jesus Lord. I want him a Savior, but I never made him Lord. I'm going to make him Lord. You might want to just sit where you are, stand there, and rededicate. Say, Lord, I've kind of veered off a little bit. I want to come back. You might need to come for salvation. You might need to come for baptism. You might want to say, I want a family of local believers. I want to join this church. I don't want to twist your arm and get you to do anything the Lord's not telling you to do. The only thing I'll tell you is the Lord's telling you to do something. Do it. Obey him, not me. Father, we thank you for this message today. We thank you for this book of Joel that, that is, is, it can be read as a disaster, but Father, we're, it's also so encouraging that it keeps bringing us back and back and back that there's no God like Jehovah. Father, we do lift up the people in uh, Louisiana and the Afghanis, the uh, situations they're in and around the world today suffering. Father, let this little church here of believers, don't dismiss the, the, don't dismiss the, the beginning of little beginnings. We may not do much.